The Middle East has exploded again. Iraq has fallen, and the United States has become deeply involved in a crisis that could possibly lead to a global conflict. Iraq is a biblical country that was called Mesopotamia in the Bible. It was here that the Garden of Eden was located. From here Abraham left his home to seek a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. It was here that Daniel had his experiences with God, and many other biblical stories came from Iraq and the Middle East. The Middle East is where history began, and the Bible teaches that it will someday conclude there. Many newspaper reporters have asked me this past week if this is the beginning of the end, or if we may be approaching the last great war. The Bible teaches that there will be a climactic point in the history of man when God will intervene in the affairs of men, and Christ will return to set up his kingdom. But whether we are approaching that moment in the present developments, no one can say. The Bible teaches that one day is as a thousand years with the Lord, and a thousand years is one day. However, these dangerous events should speak to all of us a note of warning. Christ said, Be ye ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. The Bible says, Prepare to meet thy God. Every one of us should be searching our hearts asking ourselves if we are prepared to meet God. In the meantime, while we are preparing our hearts for coming events that cast their shadows before, we should pray for peace. We should pray that somehow we may have the peace of the world at this time and a continuing opportunity to preach the gospel of Christ around the world. Today we are in the beautiful seaport city of San Diego, California. This week will conclude three months of meetings in the Golden State which began the latter part of April in San Francisco. During this period of time, in city after city, we have seen an unprecedented moving of the Holy Spirit. Large stadiums have been filled night after night, and when the invitation has been given, it has been the same everywhere. Hundreds pouring down the aisles to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. During this past week in Fresno, Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, and last night here in San Diego, the Lord has wonderfully answered the prayers of his people all over the world who have faithfully prayed for these meetings in California. I am convinced that California is the ripest spiritual harvest field in the United States. Hundreds of thousands of people have come to this state since the end of the war. Their roots are not deep. Many of them have left their church relationships and even moral standards behind. They have come to the sunshine state of California to have a fling or to make money. Thousands of them have become disillusioned. They have not found the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. They had always heard the old adage that said, Go west, young man. They have come west and have not found the happiness, joy, peace, and security that they thought existed here. They have found out that the best circumstances and the finest environment cannot bring peace of mind and happiness to the human soul. Thus, the crowds have come to hear the gospel of Christ, which has been good news to thousands of disillusioned, confused, and disappointed people as they have come night after night to the foot of the cross, acknowledging their sin and turning to Christ. I have sensed something new and deep that the Holy Spirit is doing. There has been a work of depth here that can only be attributed to God. It has not been advertising and publicity. It has not been personalities or organization. It has been the moving of the Holy Spirit among a people in spiritual need. In answer to the prayers of many of you that have been praying for the state of California, as we leave the Golden State, at least temporarily, we hope that many of you will continue to pray for this state. We are told that by 1975, there will be over 25 million people in California. The population will be doubled in the next 20 years. Thus, California needs new churches. It needs hundreds of new ministers. California needs the prayers of people all over the world as it becomes the largest state in the American Union. During this ministry in California, I have been emphasizing that the Christian life is not easy, that it is a way of discipline, renunciation, and hardship. There are many verbs and adjectives in the New Testament that describe the Christian life as hard, difficult, and rugged. Such words as fight, wrestle, run, work, suffer, resist, agonize and mortify, describe the Christian life as one of discipline. We are told that the Christian is a soldier who must suffer hardship. The apostle wrote to Timothy and said, 
Thou therefore endure a hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We are told that the Christian is a boxer who masters his own body and practices self-restraint. The apostle wrote to the Corinthians and said, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. We are told that the Christian is an athlete who must strip for every handicap. Many of us have been told that we should come to Christ, but many of us have never been taught how to live the Christian life. We have been given very little attention to the method, the technique, and the practice of Christian living. The end has been told us, but not the means. However, the scripture teaches that there is a means, a method, and a way. A Christian is a person in whom Christ dwells. He is a person who has had a personal encounter with the living Christ. He has made a choice to turn from his past way of living to Jesus Christ as Savior, Lord, and Master. Consequently, a change has taken place in his life. Old things have passed away and everything has become new. However, a Christian is more. He is a person who has accepted a challenge of self-denial and cross-bearing. Thus, we have in the scriptures that a Christian is a person who has trusted Christ as Savior, but who also obeys him as Lord. We have been told that faith without works is dead. We have certain expressions that seem a paradox at times in the Bible, such as receiving and doing, resting and striving. Thus we find the Christian life begins as an act of receiving Christ, but it must continue as a lifelong attitude of receiving, trusting, and doing. Jesus made it quite clear when he said to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The Bible suggests four motives for denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following Christ. First, we are to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Christ because of the debt we owe. It is a mark of good character to meet one's obligations and to pay one's debts. Every person listening to my voice is in debt to Jesus Christ. Almost every freedom we know in America today has its roots in his teachings. The American concept of democracy stems directly or indirectly from the teachings of Christ. Without him, the world would be plunged into political chaos and cultural darkness. Every woman listening to my voice owes a debt of gratitude to Jesus Christ that she could never repay in a thousand lifetimes. Where the teachings of Christ have not gone, woman has been considered little more than an animal. Every laboring man that belongs to a labor union has a debt to Jesus Christ. It was through the conversion of men like Lord Shaftesbury and others that the modern labor movement came into being as we know it. Minority groups that enjoy freedom in this and other countries owe a debt of gratitude to Christ because it was through his teachings that the shackles were torn off the slaves. However, there is a sense in which the whole human race owes a debt of gratitude to Christ for another reason. The Bible says, For Christ hath once suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. He gave up heaven that we might gain it. He became sin that we might be free from it. He died in our place that we might have life. He was afflicted that we might be healed. He became poor that we might be made rich. He bore the cross that we might wear a crown. He was rejected that we might be accepted. Every one of us is deeply indebted to Christ. Many years ago, a pleasure craft was wrecked in a storm on Lake Michigan. A young lifeguard from Northwestern University rescued 17 lives from the turbulent waters. When they took him to his room in a state of complete exhaustion, his only question was, did I do my best? His name was Edward Spencer. Later, he attended one of Dr. R.A. Torrey's meetings here in California. Dr. Torrey asked him to come to the platform amid a loud applause from the audience. The minister asked Spencer, if anything in particular stood out in his mind in connection with his saving of those 17 lives. Only one thing, Spencer replied, of the 17 saved, not one ever thanked me. If we have no other motive for serving Christ, gratitude should be sufficient inducement. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Yes, he redeemed us. He purchased our pardon. He reconciled us to God. He made us joint heirs with him. And daily he showers us with countless blessings and benefits. Love so amazing, so divine, demands our love, our life, and our all. The scripture says, 
and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them. Out of gratitude, you should live for the one who died for you. It is a debt we all owe to Christ. Secondly, we should deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him because of the position we hold. The Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he the privilege to become the sons of God. If you have trusted in Christ for your salvation, you're a member of the aristocracy of heaven. The Bible says, ye are a chosen generation, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Therefore abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. We are the sons of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. What a position. Three years ago, my wife and I had the privilege of being entertained by Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh at their home in Windsor Castle. We had lunch and spent a part of the afternoon. While there, I could not help getting the impression that while royalty may seem glamorous to millions of subjects, yet there are heavy penalties to pay. It seemed that the Queen carried the burdens of the world upon her shoulders. There are certain things that members of the British royal household would like to do, but it is impossible because of the position they hold. In one sense, they're almost prisoners. I'm sure that they often gaze wistfully out at the crowds and long to be nobody. They long for the freedoms that only privacy can give. It is impossible because of the position they hold. As children of divine royalty, we are exhorted to live in accordance with our position. Members of earthly royalty have privileges, but they also have responsibilities. Their lives must measure up to their high position. They cannot go certain places, nor do certain things that commoners do, but the privileges they enjoy far outweigh the restrictions that are placed upon them. As members of the royal family, we ought to abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. Dare to be different as a Christian. Conduct yourself in such a manner that people will brand you as a child of God. The world will judge you not by your profession, but by your walk. Yours is a unique position, and your conversation, your manner, and your conduct should be that which becomes heavenly royalty. To live a completely dedicated Christian life is not done out of a mere sense of duty. It is a position of love and affection. Christians are called the bride of Christ. We are his beloved, so our separation from the world is one of love as the bride to her bridegroom. The bridegroom brooks no rivals. He is jealous of the bride. The world is envious of such a blissful union as Christ with his bride. It seeks to alienate our affections. The devil seeks to seduce us and to entice us to put other things first in our lives. To be faithful to Christ and to bear his cross will never be popular. The mob around the cross laughed, mocked, and ridiculed. He was crucified by the world. The same world system is in control in the 20th century. To live a dedicated, self-denying, cross-bearing life will never be popular with the world system. Because of the position we hold, we should be anxious that nothing impair that position. The question for a true child of God is not what is good or bad, but what is best. John Wesley's mother told her children, whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, increases the strength and authority of your body. That thing is wrong, no matter how innocent it may seem. Self-denial carries with it the idea of the denial of our ego, of our self-centeredness and selfishness. Thirdly, we are to deny self, take up our cross and follow him because of the cross we share. Christ said, if any man come after me, let him take up his cross. The history of Christianity is one long record of men and women who were willing to take up their cross and follow Christ. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, whereby the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. David Livingston, in poor health but determined to go back to Africa despite many discouragements, said, Through my streaming eyes I see the cross, and in the light of that sacrifice I can do no other. Luther, bucking the tide of popular opinion and stiff opposition, took up the cross and carried it across Europe until a new light was burning in the world. John Huss, with the vision of the cross before him, preached in Prague, fearlessly proclaiming the gospel of redemption until his enemies burned him to a stake when he failed to renounce his Lord. But where are the reformers? Where are the martyrs? Where are the Christian zealots of yesteryear? Is there no place for the cross in the modern version of Christianity? Yes, 
The church has its Betty Elliots in the jungles of South America and its Trevor Huddlestons fighting the black man's battles in Africa. But there is also a cross that every one of you is to bear in your daily living. You can go back into the jungle of society and live Christ and it will cost you something. It may cost you prestige, social position, and many friendships to live a life of self-denial. It may mean that certain people, you will be unpopular. It means that you must be honest in all your transactions, no matter if it means business failure. The cross of Christ still cuts deeply into our selfish ambition. It still dethrones the idols enshrined in our hearts. It still probes the heart where there is illicit love. It still is an instrument upon which the old self of sin is crucified. Paul said, whereby the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Fourthly, we are to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Christ because of the hope we await. The Bible says, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. And again the scripture says, denying worldly lust we should look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. If heaven is all the Bible says it is. If eternity means an endless existence with our beloved Savior, and it does. If the joys of the celestial city with its unspeakable loveliness is all that is promised, and it is, then it is worth any sacrifice, any self-denial, renunciation of sin, and loss of face we may experience. The apostle said, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The man that led me to Christ many years ago while conducting one of his great evangelistic crusades in Charlotte, North Carolina, used to sing in the middle of his sermons a song that I'll never forget. The trials of life will seem nothing when we get to the end of the way. Yes, we are to live a life of self-denial and cross-bearing if we are to successfully follow Christ. The motives we have mentioned are fourfold. The debt we owe, the position we hold, the cross we share, and the hope we await. The choice is before you. The world calls, enjoy yourself, but Christ calls, give yourself. The world calls, live for this life. Christ calls, live for eternity. The world appeals to the worst in you. Christ calls for the best in you. I beg of you today to put your hands in the pierced hands of the Savior and say, whether thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Whose servant will you be? What life, what destiny do you choose? Today, by repentance and faith, you can receive Christ. And if you're a Christian, you can determine by rededication today that you're presenting yourself completely on the altar of self-denial and cross-bearing to follow the Savior. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God in Christ's name today, we pray that every Christian shall recognize his responsibility to the Savior in this dark and critical hour of history to bear his cross and deny himself that he may successfully follow the Savior. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.